Welcome DEF CON uh, to Offensive Forensics, CSI for Bad Guys. <laughs> uh, I am, if you can read, Benjamin Caudill, uh, Principal Consultant of Rhino Security Labs. Uh, and I kind of want to get this uh, talk started off with a story as to kind of how this concept came about. Uh, I was doing a, a pen test several years ago with, uh, actually when I was kind of a, a junior assessor, uh, for a financial institution uh, in, a, in a case a while back where during the uh, information gathering phase we had determined that the company had gone from kind of a decentralized infrastructure to a centralized one, which really just means that they have database servers now. Uh, so it kind of in, during this phase we had uh, discovered, a, a enumerated a lot of information about the company, found out that uh, a lot of their data assessors or data analysts had uh, local copies of the entire PII database on their local system, uh, which what can go wrong, right? So uh, naturally this was kind of the, the target for social engineering and spear phishing and all these sort of things uh, and, and got, managed to get access to several of these systems and uh, we really only needed one of these PII, data, PII databases uh, to be golden. Uh, that, that was the whole objective here. Uh, went after uh, one system after another after another, uh, hours and hours of searching, days and, and weeks even, uh, and couldn't find anything. Not a single search number on any of these systems. Uh, so we kind of wrapped things up, had the kind of uh, post talk discussion with the, the manager there uh, where it came out that he had previously sent an email out to the department saying, hey, if you have any of these databases still laying around, uh, make sure you, one, delete them and two, empty the recycle bin. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, so uh, kind of just having finished up the, the pen test and so forth, uh, uh, between my partner and I, uh, we kind of became this guy as we realized that if we would have just looked at the MFT, uh, grabbed a disk image of the system and really kind of done a almost a forensic analysis of these systems that we would have compromised, we would have had millions of social security numbers on any one of these given systems. So close. Uh, so this kind of concept really led to the uh, the, the concept I'm kind of talking about today, uh, offensive forensics, and this is really where I realized that if I would have taken a more forensics based approach to the kind of post exploitation phase and information gathering and so forth, uh, we would have, a, would have had a lot much more success. Uh, so uh, again this is not really a talk so much about the forensics side of things, it's more about forensics applied in a, a new and unconventional way. So again, uh, I am Benjamin Caudill, Principal Consultant with Rhino Security Labs. I uh, have some uh, experience in, in pen testing, social engineering, uh, web applications, uh, that sort of thing. About four years in security now, d uh, been with aerospace and defense industry. Uh, I mentioned finance a little bit, been doing consulting recently, kind of the normal stuff. Uh, about eight years in IT, so I'm uh, a well versed nerd. Uh, and a number of certifications, but again, we're at DEF CON, so who really cares about that? <laughs> Someone started drinking early. Uh, so the overview of the talk. So we're going to start with kind of the traditional forensics, uh, a little bit about the, the background on that and what that means and kind of how this ties into everything. Uh, I'm going to jump into kind of the offensive side and offensive forensics, introduction of that, uh, the basics and everything. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of do a deep dive into really the, the technical details here, uh, looking at the, the memory forensics, the potential and problems we have with that, uh, disk and registry, again a lot of these examples are Windows based, uh, and, and kind of the potential and problems with the, the disk and, and registry side. Uh, and then towards the end, uh, releasing a new Metasploit module to kind of cover all the things that I have previously discussed, uh, some quick usage and hopefully a demo. So uh, the traditional uh, kind of digital forensics is, is essentially the recovery and investigation of material found in digital devices. Uh, pretty simple concept but this is a really useful idea for us as pen testers as we are essentially trying to get digital information from, the, from these systems. Uh, th this kind of is, is applicable or useful to us uh, not only in explicitly uh, useful information or explicitly sensitive information, social security numbers, passwords, things like that, but also implicitly sensitive. Things like a, a calendar, uh, a, a contact list of the entire company. Uh, these are things that we can utilize towards social engineering, towards password cracking, uh, a lot of uh, other uh, attack avenues that wouldn't be necessarily uh, on a technical front but can still s uh, certainly be very useful. 
Uh, so again, kind of a lot of the traditional forensics tools and really concepts uh, are essentially for investigations, whether that's civil, corporate, uh, criminal, whatever the case may be. The objective for forensics essentially is to solve a crime, loosely speaking. Uh, so again, as a result of this, uh, there's very few forensic tools that are uh, very applicable to pen testers directly. So kind of on a, a more direct front then, offensive forensics is the use of forensics techniques for offensive purposes. And I kind of uh, have the subtext here of, of uh, again, improved social engineering, more efficient password cracking, uh, being able to get a, a better dictionary list, for example, by, uh, again, uh, grabbing something like a contact list uh, is very useful. Uh, and, and again, kind of going back to what I said earlier, the, this is really useful in a traditional post-exploitation uh, situation uh, where those kind of typical steps, post-exploitation steps, are really insufficient for, for getting to the, the next level, uh, moving laterally or, or getting passwords or things like that. And uh, frankly, pen testing has a time limit. You can't spend all day uh, key logging a, a particular system even if you do have access uh, and waiting for the, the user or the, the multiple users to go to a particular form, web page, whatever the case may be. It's much more easy, uh, much more efficient to, uh, to kind of do some of this forensic analysis and, and grab previous files like, like browser files for example uh, and grab those and use those as a basis for your next steps rather than the key logging out route. Uh, so again, kind of comparing the offensive with the, the, the traditional forensics, the objective here is really to gain access to sensitive additional, uh, additional sensitive information, again, whether that's explicit or implicit. So uh, again, uh, the forensic comparison here, uh, traditional forensics and, and offensive forensics have very different processes. Uh, traditional forensics, again, even with a live analysis, the, the process is essentially grab the memory, pull the plug, do disk forensics and get a lot of those files that you uh, couldn't access when it was live because, uh, because they're being used by the OS. Uh, I use the example here of uh, hyperfill.sys, page this, things like that and of course the Linux compliments there. Uh, a live analysis for f uh, offensive forensics is very different because you don't have physical access or it's assumed that you don't. Um, we, we can still grab memory. Uh, we have the benefit of not having to worry about the legal side of things. Uh, we don't have to worry about chain of custody, uh, loss of potential loss of, or modification of evidence, uh, and, and really the, the legal analysis. Uh, but we also have the disadvantage again of uh, a lot of the permission I permissions issues in Windows or whatever your OS is uh, prevent you from accessing a lot of those core OS files uh, that we would want to access. So again there's a little bit of a difference, some of those files are less useful than they would be otherwise. Uh, on the dead analysis, again, uh, it's assumed that you have physical access to the box when you're doing a, a traditional uh, forensic analysis of things, uh, which we can also kind of presume is the case with offensive forensics, uh, but is not as common. Uh, in addition to that, also we lose the potential kind of user interaction or live memory uh, exploitation of having the user actually be on the system at that time. If you, happen, if you happen to be typing in your password at the same time that I'm grabbing a memory dump, I win. Uh, so kind of again uh, for the offensive forensic side when we're actually doing a pen test, more often than not this is going to be a remote attack or a remote or a, a live analysis scenario. So I'm going to kind of focus on the live analysis uh, situation from here on out. So kind of d diving more into the, the technical details here, uh, on the memory side we have a, a wide range of things that we can look at and, and again memory forensics is in itself its, its own science. So this isn't again not a, a forensic lesson but more of an application lesson. Uh, this range is kind of from the simple, uh, again Windows clipboard I use it as an, as an example, uh, applicable when you're talking about password managers, copy paste, if I grab it at the right time, again clear text passwords to kind of the niche uh, command line history. I've never actually seen this myself but uh, DOS key slash history will give you a full list of everything the user has typed in that given session. Again, theoretically this could uh, bring up anything from uh, added users uh, for a, like a sysadmin case to FTP, telnet sessions and any, any number of other things. Uh, as, as well as kind of a more fragmented subject, things like passwords, key files, uh, encryption keys. Uh, at the very least, uh, you can grab uh, encryption keys and things like that. There's, there's numerous papers on, on TrueCrypt, for example, being able to grab the encryption key and, and open containers. Uh, but again, as I mentioned with the Windows clipboard example, in certain cases you can't actually grab clear text passwords from any given process. 
Uh, another one I wanted to mention was kind of on the, the almost on the, the privacy side is is private browsing and sandboxing. There's there's a lot of uh, <laughs> kind of despite the moniker of porn mode, uh, a lot of these private browsers are actually used uh, by users because of the the implied sensitive uh, nature of the of the browser. You can't. Uh, there's no records kept and so forth, and so it would be theoretically more secure to you know go to your go to your bank or go to a sensitive site, things like that. Uh, and again, there's multiple papers on the the flaws with uh, with a lot of this logic. Um, the one that comes to mind is is IE's in private, uh, which actually writes files to disk during that uh, private session. It, it deletes the files at the end, but again, going back a slide or two, uh, being able to recover those files through the MFT and, and grab those deleted files essentially allows me to uh, replicate or, or look into your private session, which who knows why you're doing that. Uh, along the same line, another kind of example of this is uh, when you're actually catching this in memory, uh, there's a lot more kind of uh, unique identifiers for nearly every one of these private browsers that uh, if you were to catch it in memory, do a memory dump or so forth, uh, you could actually identify that this is running as a private session, which again could highlight um, kind of to the pen tester why the user is doing that uh, and might be something to look at specifically. Uh, and actually we are working on a volatility plugin to do exactly this, but I wasn't able to get it done today, so look for it. On the uh, disk and registry side, uh, there's there's a number of files here that I'm going to list uh, and kind of areas really to look at. Uh, the first one that really comes to mind here, uh, kind of through my own research, was browser files. Uh, every one of the four or five major browsers has some sort of browser leakage to to one extreme or the other, uh, but all of them are useful. Uh, I use the example here of Firefox, really just to pick on them, but all of them are kind of the same case. Uh, I list a number of Firefox files here, uh, key3.db, uh, kind of from the, the obvious or the simple password files, bookmarks and history, again, in, in the right context, certainly useful, uh, to things that are a little bit more subtle but certainly interesting, uh, like the formhistory.sqlite file is something I'm going to look a little bit more into, uh, which provides all the saved form data for the, the uh, particular browser. So, kind of following that uh, bunny hole, um, this, this particular example was from a pen test I did a while back of a, that same form history dot SQLite uh, where we got uh, essentially full credit card data uh, of the particular victim. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. Uh, but in, in this case obviously didn't help with the, the actual pen test. Moving forward though, we actually uh, did a little bit more analysis here and found that there was both a, a clear text uh, account or a, a username essentially as well as uh, clear text recovery, recovery questions recovery questions? Uh, to actually reset that account. Uh, so kind of using some of those previously, previous things I had mentioned, uh, the, this particular uh, database, the HR database actually, uh, was, was being used uh, and this in conjunction with the saved password or the saved uh, history, I was able to actually reset the password on this account and uh, get access to the system. Uh, so some more examples here of, of kind of things to look at. Uh, the, the MRU list most recently used, what has the user been looking at? Prefetch files, what has the, the user been running? I use the example of uh, truecryptformat.exe, uh, a file that is only uh, accessed or specifically the prefetch file, a file that's only created really, uh, when the user has actually created a TrueCrypt container on that system. Uh, so this is really the difference between uh, finding TrueCrypt on the system and, and believing they may have a TrueCrypt container on there and actually knowing for sure that there is a TrueCrypt container out there and where to actually find that. Uh, another big one, kind of as I mentioned at the very beginning, was deleted files, slack space. Again, a huge subject in and of itself. Uh, but there's a couple good, really good Metasploit modules kind of specific to this subject. Won't dive too much into that. Uh, but backups and volume shadow copy service, uh, another huge area uh, you can get a lot of good information on. Uh, kind of a quick horror story on this uh, is I was doing another pen test where the <coughs> was able to get on the, the system of a sysadmin who regularly did the, the password resets for users and uh, found out very quickly that after every single one of these password resets, he would clear the entire log of his chat history, uh, which is where he gave the passwords out to, to prevent, you know, exploitation or, or data leakage or whatever the case may be. Uh, but he never actually deleted the file, uh, so I couldn't, you know, grab it through a, a, the MFT or deleted files or so forth. 
but he did have the volume shadow copy uh, service running uh, and when I accessed that I could see all the previous conversations uh, from previous backups of this and actually access uh, all those uh, previous passwords he had given, it, given out. Uh, a couple more examples, crash dumps. Again, theoretically this is something that's useful. Uh, typically this is uh, really only kernel memory that's being dumped uh, on a Windows system anyway. Uh, this is also really useful though as these, this can be changed. Uh, this is a setting in Windows. Again, it's something to look at if, uh, if you find it. Uh, and the last one here is kind of a, a list of miscellaneous things. Calendars, address books, uh, other smartphone backups. Uh, again, you can get contacts, pictures, uh, GPS data off of iTunes backups, things like that. Uh, print spools, you know, what has the user been printing? And, and a ton more. Uh, and again, this is all a lot of implicit, implicitly sensitive information. Uh, you can use for spear phishing, watering holes, uh, again, more efficient password cracking using uh, tools like CUP and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but really we have the issue of as we get more files uh, to look for, more, more potential, we also have the problem of practicality. Uh, looking through these let's say 500 files, it's going to be very difficult and, and uh, very time consuming to actually do this all by hand. Uh, again, not all of these apply to every OS, uh, every version of Windows, uh, application version and so forth. Uh, so uh, th again, this is kind of where an interpreter script was born out of this. Uh, forensic scraper, uh, which using OIdentific OS identification, grabs and downloads all this awesome stuff, uh, browser files, most recently used files, uh, prefetch data, uh, Windows crash dumps, print spools, and a ton more that I can't even list here. So kind of a, a very quick demo because I'm running out of time here. Uh, it's, it's a very simple uh, Metasploit application or Metasploit module here. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a point and shoot. Uh, I, I threw up a couple quick uh, snapshots here. The, the first is some some IE cookies, uh, you can see in the, the uh, Windows directory there. And, uh, and very shortly thereafter is uh, network shortcuts, which is uh, all the, the network shortcuts that are uh, saved under my computer. Again, useful stuff. Um, this is another example where they had uh, two browsers on one system and you can actually see all the stuff in yellow is all the Chrome files that were grabbed, uh, including cookies, uh, history, login data, passwords. Uh, and things like that and the Firefox is, is all the information that I had mentioned previously, again, that form data, downloads, uh, login data and so on and so forth. Uh, so for QA, uh, for QA there is a QA room actually afterwards, you can find me there, I will be there for a little bit. Uh, on this actual forensic scraper uh, module, uh, we will be releasing this within the next uh, couple days or so, so look for that either on the, the website or we're sending that to DEF CON, I don't know if they have a place for that. Uh, it'll be out there anyway. Uh, contact, there's my email address or you can find us on Twitter if you have something else. And that is all I got.